Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, biofuels. I know that's a shock for you to hear that I would be talking about biofuels. Uh, and uh, it shouldn't be a surprise to you that our current use of petroleum fuels puts a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere um, on the order of half a gigaton of carbon per year. So uh, then let's talk about ways we might get around this. You might have heard on uh, the news yesterday, I think it was, or the day before, that uh, uh, the US EPA has ruled in on some of the uh, carbon outputs, carbon dioxide outputs of fuels. And they said that if uh, ethanol from corn was produced in an, in an efficient way, that it would reduce carbon dioxide output to the atmosphere by about 20%. Um, so that's good news. We don't know what efficient means. Um, the bad news is that this is probably not the best way to do it. But uh, up here is the route uh, that we currently use to uh, get ethanol from sunlight. We go through corn, of course. Uh, we can produce about five tons of corn per acre. Um, uh, that's about 200 bushels per acre. Um, that uh, is in the form of starch, and that starch has to be extracted, so we use pretreatment methods to extract that starch. Uh, it's then broken down to sugars using enzymes, amylases, um, and then consumed by microbes, primarily yeast, to produce ethanol. And you get about 20% ethanol at best in these industrial fermentations. If you do this at home, probably not nearly that high. Now, uh, there are many challenges uh, with that route to uh, ethanol. Uh, one is the plant itself, corn. Corn is expensive to raise, expensive in terms of the water usage and expensive in terms of the fertilizer need. In fact, US production of fertilizer is uh, about one third of the energy used in agriculture and nitrogen-based fertilizers account for 1% of the world's use of energy. So pretty substantial use of energy and a lot of that's used in fertilizing corn. So we'd like to replace that uh, with uh, a more readily available and less expensive source of those sugars, namely biomass. Now this is going to require uh, new plants, of course. It's going to require different pretreatment methods because now we're talking about a completely different polymer of sugar. It's, and that means it's going to require new enzymes to release the, that <coughs> sugar. And eventually, we'd actually like to replace the fuel. So to give you some idea of how much biomass there is, uh, the US Department of Energy and USDA did an assessment in 2005. And they found that there was about 1.3 billion tons of biomass lying fallow every year. This is in the form of perennial crops, corn stovers, so what's left over of the corn uh, after you take the uh, kernel off, a wheat straw, soy, et cetera, and of course, urban and municipal waste. Now to give you some idea of how much energy is in that 1.3 billion tons of biomass. I want to put it into perspective uh, with the US petroleum consumption in 2007. So in 2007, we consumed about 7.5 billion barrels of oil. Roughly uh, two thirds of that was imported and a third was domestically produced. If you burn that biomass, that 1.3 billion tons of biomass, you get roughly the amount of energy if you burn uh, the imported oil. And if we turned that biomass now into fuels using what are called midterm conversion technologies, technologies that are in the foreseeable future, we could get to nearly the domestic production of fuels. Uh, now, that's not bad, uh, but that means uh, not, no, no dedicated energy crops, no crops that are uh, optimized to be energy crops. And that means conversion technologies that may not be optimal. So we might be able to do much better than this. Now, just to tell you a little bit about how hard this problem is, this is a plant cell wall. Um, plant cells would have lived here. Um, they've since died, and this is what's been left behind. <clears throat> and that plant cell wall is extremely complicated. This is from a paper from Chris Somerville uh, from a few years ago. This is an artist rendition, mainly to show that it's really complicated. And, uh, uh, this is a, a, a bit more uh, detail uh, about that cell wall. So the cell wall is composed primarily of three polymers, lignin, cellulose, and hemicellulose. So cellulose is a polymer of glucose, sugars. 
Uh, hemicellulose, so six carbon sugars. Hemicellulose is a polymer of five carbon sugars. And lignin is a polymer of aromatics. And lignin is very difficult to deconstruct. Cellulose and hemicellulose are also pretty hard to, to deconstruct. If you think about this shirt, which is cotton, um, and you know, think about the fact that it's composed of sugar, and yet when you put it in your washing machine, it doesn't dissolve. That tells you how strong the bonds are in that cellulose, in those sugars, and the kind of energy uh, it's going to take to break down that cellulose into the sugars. Um, and this just shows uh, the cellulose microfibril, like you might have in a cotton shirt. And it's the hydrogen bonding between those strands of cellulose uh, that make them so strong. So if, if we want to be able to break down this biomass and efficiently release as many sugars as possible, that means that we need optimal pretreatment methods. Now, the pretreatment methods that have been explored in the past tend to use high temperatures, high pressures, or low and, or high pH. And the problem with that is that the processing equipment you need um, has to be pretty uh, rigorous, pretty uh, tough. And that makes it really expensive. And your goal, really, is to pull that lignin away from the cellulose and hemicellulose and then break that down into the uh, sugars that can be utilized by the microbe to produce the ethanol. So we need new pretreatment processes. Now, the other challenge is in the enzymes itself that break down the cellulose and hemicellulose. If you take starch that comes from corn, starch is uh, very easy to break down. In fact, it's slightly soluble. Um, you can use uh, really essentially a single enzyme, amylase, to break it down. But that's not the case with cellulose and hemicellulose. There are hemicellulases specific for hemicellulose, and there are cellulases specific for cellulose and different kinds. So endocellulases break inside the cellulose chain. Exocellulases chew in from the end and release single sugars or uh, disaccharides. But the point here is that we need a variety of enzymes. And the enzymes that we've been using industrially for this process are extremely expensive and are sourced from primarily a single organi organism, trichoderma. So um, organ organizations like JBay and the EBI are working on all aspects of this process, trying to come up with better plants that will more efficiently sequester CO2 and utilize sunlight and turn that into biomass, of course, using as little uh, resources as possible in terms of water and fertilizer. We're trying to come up with pretreatment methods that will allow us to readily release the cellulose and hemicellulose from that biomass and new enzymes from interesting environments to break down the cellulose into the component sugars. And finally, I, I want to just spend a minute talking about fuels. Uh, as uh, a society, we've been using natural fuels, if you will, molecules that uh, nature has given us as fuels, like ethanol and butanol. And uh, ethanol is an OK uh, oxygenate for gasoline, but it doesn't have the full fuel value of gasoline. In fact, if you have a flex fuel car and you put a gallon of ethanol in it, you'll get about a 2 thirds of the miles that you would get out of a gallon of gasoline. Um, what's more, ethanol is corrosive. So uh, you have to have a special car um, if you're going to use it uh, more than 10%. You can't pipe it through petroleum pipelines because it's corrosive. Um, and so it has to be shipped with rail car and by trucks. And what's more, yeast, which produces the ethanol, only produces it at max 20%, which means you've got 80% water. And the way you get ethanol out of the water and purify it is by distillation. And that means a lot of heat, a lot of energy, a lot of cost. Ethanol is really better for drinking than for driving. <laughs> We have the philosophy in JBay, and I think in the EBI as well, that we're at a point with biology where we don't have to accept what nature has given us, that we can retool biology to make the fuels that are compatible with the $3 trillion or so of transportation infrastructure that we have in this country. We can make fuels that are identical to or have identical properties to the petroleum-based fuels. So this means long-chain hydrocarbons, branch-chain hydrocarbons, the very components that we see in gasoline, in diesel fuel, and jet fuel. You heard Natasha's talk about batteries. I think it's conceivable that as batteries get better, we're going to have passenger automobiles that 
are battery operated. I think it's less conceivable that we're going to have large trucks running on batteries delivering goods. And it's inconceivable to me that we're going to have planes run on batteries. So we're going to need transportation fuels in the future. And these transportation fuels have to be compatible. We're not going to replace the entire airplane fleet in this country in order to use a fuel that nature gave us. So our whole goal um, in this aspect uh, of J-Bay is producing fuels that are compatible with our transportation infrastructure. So uh, just a bit about J-Bay. We have three science divisions, feedstocks, deconstruction, and fuel synthesis. And we have a technologies division. And, and um, what's a little bit different about J-Bay, and some of you have heard me talk about this before, is that in a traditional academic institute, um, you might have collaborators from different organizations. And you'd send the money out to them, and they'd do their work. And maybe some of them would work on the plant side, and others in another institution on the pretreatment side, and others on enzymes, et cetera. And then they'd come together for annual retreats or conference calls and talk about the science. And in J-Bay, we said, no, we weren't going to do it that way. We we're going to break down those silos, get rid of them all together, uh, and put everybody in a single location so that they just have to run into each other every day um, to pass along the science. You can't take that for granted, as it turns out. You still have to have retreats um, and meetings. But um, they do bump into each other more. So we brought together. Uh, Berkeley Lab as, as the lead with Sandia uh, and Livermore National Laboratories, as well as UC Berkeley, UC Davis, and the Carnegie Institution for Science, which has its plant biology department at Stanford. And everybody's here in Emeryville in this great building, which some of you know about. Just want to talk a minute about why you might want to put everybody together. Why bother bringing all these people together from these different organizations, besides the fact that they just bump into each other in the hall and know each other? Well. Uh, this uh, problem that I'm going to talk about for just a few seconds um, illustrates why it's important to have people together. And so one of the challenges in using biomass as a source for fuels is um, these, this, this is hemicellulose here. And it links together cellulose bonds that are in the cell wall. So it's really a linking polymer. And this hemicellulose is, as I said, five carbon sugars. So that's a challenge in and of itself because yeast doesn't naturally utilize five carbon sugars. But the bigger challenge is actually these functional groups that decorate the hemicellulose. These tie together the hemicellulose to the lignin um, and the cellulose, things like acetate groups and ferrolate groups. And the problem with those is they get released from the hemicellulose when it's being pretreated. They end up in the fermentation broth, and they poison the microbes that produce the fuel. So there are multiple ways you could approach this problem. And this is one of, illustrates why it's so important to have people together in one location. Our plant folks are going in and engineering plants. So they've gone in, discovered the enzymes that add on these functional groups. And this is actually a pretty tough process, because in switchgrass, it isn't sequenced. So we've got to go in and actually discover the enzymes. Um, and they're actually not known in rice either, but we, at least we have a sequence. They're going into those plants, discovering the enzymes that add on these functional groups and eliminating them and looking to see how it affects the plant. Does it completely kill the plant? Um, and they assay to determine how many of them have been removed uh, and then look at the growth of the plant. Well, as it turns out, uh, when they did this, those plants become more resistant to fung fungal pathogens. We don't know why. We have no idea. And it illustrates how complex biology is. But even doing this research to remove something that was deleterious to the process actually turned out to be a great thing. Now, the problem, though, with this research is it takes years to get plants into the field. It's like getting a drug into the hands of people from the discovery process. Um, they have to be uh, field tested. Um, the EPA has to certify them. So there's a huge aspect in engineered plants of getting them out long time periods. So you want to have some alternatives in case that doesn't work, in case the plants die, in case you can't get them into the fields. So another alternative is in the pretreatment process. You could start to use gentler pretreatment processes um, that don't release these or that remove them altogether from the fermentation broth. And so uh, our folks in deconstruction are working with ionic liquids that will actually remove these completely. And so they don't end up in the fermentation broth. And the folks in fuel synthesis are engineering the microbes to actually utilize these just in case they get through that pretreatment process and turn them into fuels. 
So three different ways of approaching the problem. I'm betting that at least one of them will work, and maybe all three will work. But by having people together in one location, they can work together on this problem. Uh, once they've engineered the plant, they can pass it on to the pretreatment group, and then that biomass can be passed on to the fuel synthesis group, and they can work on all these aspects of the problem. Now, we utilize a lot of facilities um, at LBNL um, to accomplish this research, and I want to just talk about a, a few of those. We're using, of course, the Joint Genome Institute, and I'll talk about this uh, in a little more detail. Um, we're using a lot of the sequencing capacity there, and it's been really important for us to be able to discover the genes involved in uh, the development of these plants. So now we have genome sequences for rice, and we're getting genome sequences for switchgrass, and this will speed the research tremendously. We're also using uh, a lot of the imaging resources here at the lab to look at the plant cell walls, how they change as we go in and engineer the plant um, to uh, have, you know, remove, remove the acetate groups or the ferrolate groups, and also how the deconstruction process is treating the biomass and, and what turns up in the biomass after you've gone through things like ionic liquids. We, in the uh, pretreatment process, I said that we were using the imaging facilities, uh, like the molecular foundry as well, some of the resources there. We're also doing computations to try to understand how the ionic liquids interact with the lignin and the cellulose and hemicellulose so that we can optimize this process better. And then, of course, uh, we're doing imaging of the plant cell walls. And this just shows what a plant cell wall looks like before pretreatment and after pretreatment with these ionic liquids. And you can see that there's absolutely no structure left. And this is a little bit closer uh, view of it, but these are actually cellulose strands that have been released from this plant cell wall. And now these are free to be acted upon by the cellulases. Now, this image actually shows uh, kind of a before and after of if you take this cellulose that's been pre-treated with ionic liquids and lay it down on a solid surface and then you act on it with cellulases. We can actually measure the kinetics of what's going on here um, uh, using various imaging techniques that are available here at the lab. So this tells us about the kinetics of the enzymes and how fast they move along on the cellulose and hemicellulose. Um, and uh, we're going to places like um, uh, uh, composting facilities. This one in particular in California has been around for 10 years and they've got microbes that are really tuned to degrading biomass. So we're going in and sequencing that compost, um, looking at all of the microbes that are in that compost and all the cellulases uh, that those microbes might harbor. We've also gone to uh, the rainforest and in fact I was just there a couple of months ago in Puerto Rico Puerto Rico has an, uh, a very interesting environment. It has some of the highest biomass turnover rates of anywhere on the planet. That means that the biomass is degraded the most rapidly of anywhere. So we're going in to uh, the, the floor of the rainforest, taking bags of switchgrass in there. We bury them for a few weeks. And then we go back, we pull up those bags of switchgrass, and they have on them microbes that are degrading the switchgrass. We take them to the Joint Genome Institute and they sequence all of the microbes that are degrading that switchgrass, and we look for cellulases that might be compatible with our processes. And of course, some of these cellulases then, we've gone to the advanced light source, and this is actually a structure of one of the cellulases that came out of an organism, a high temperature organism, from a compost. And what's so interesting about this cellulase is that it's got a domain on it that looks like an antibody binding domain. It's got the same kind of structure. And what we think is going on here is that this actually binds the cellulose and feeds it into the active site so this can chew it up. Now, what's important about uh, having a structure, crystal structures, now we can go in and engineer this enzyme. So we've gone in, engineered the enzymes um, uh, to put uh, cysteines in here so that we can cross-link uh, the uh, protein, essentially and make it stronger, more resistant to some of the processing conditions that you might find in an industrial processing facility. Um, and as I said, we are engineering microbes to produce advanced biofuels, and again, we're using the resources of the Joint Genome Institute to do that. Now, JGI has had uh, a very strong program in uh, bioenergy, and this just shows 
a small sample of the organisms that they've already sequenced. So a number of uh, plants uh, have been sequenced and uh, they're currently working on the sequences I mentioned of switchgrass uh, and a very important resource for us if, we're, if we ever hope to engineer plants for the future. Um, I mentioned that they have been doing a lot of sequencing of uh, compost and of the uh, soil from Puerto Rico. Um, uh, and again, there's a huge list of microbes um, and cellulases that have come out of these, including uh, microbes from the termite gut and I believe now from the cow gut. And then, of course, there are a number of yeast and other organisms that naturally produce butanol and ethanol, and they're extremely resistant to those fuels. And while we may not want to use ethanol as a fuel going forward, understanding the mechanisms they use to resist those fuels and become tolerant to them is extremely important for producing uh, real fuels going forward. Um, and, and here shows uh, just a tree uh, of microbes that have been uh, sequenced uh, at JGI. And this is just a small fraction of them, but uh, an incredible resource we have in the Joint Genome Institute and in their sequencing capacity. Um, let me just, this one particular organism actually is quite interesting. Uh, this actually comes from the Great Salt Lake in Utah, hence its name, Utahensis. And it actually has a cellulase gene cluster. Why it has a cellulose gene cluster, I don't know. Uh, there must be a lot of cellulose in uh, the Great Salt Lake, even though there aren't any plants growing around it. Um, but what's important about this cellulase is that it's resistant to salt. And I, I mentioned earlier that our um, deconstruction division is working on ionic liquids as a solvent for treating biomass, because ionic liquids are able to pull apart cellulose and lignin very efficiently. Well, what gets left behind in the cellulose is a lot of salt. And that means that you need enzymes, or you'd like to have enzymes that are resistant to the salt in, those, uh, in that ionic liquid treated biomass. Um, so uh, uh, after we uh, treat the biomass with ionic liquid, so here's the biomass and this is the after, we then use this uh, and add uh, hemicellulases to it. And these particular hemicellulases from um, this organism from the Great Salt Lake seem to have very good activity in high salt conditions. Now, uh, those uh, resources at the JGI don't have to be used exclusively for uh, biofuels. We can also use those resources to try to understand carbon, carbon cycling in the environment. So the JGI is going in and sequencing organisms in the subsurface to try to understand how those organisms impact carbon cycling. Can we stimulate them to sequester more carbon? And of course, uh, once you have that genome sequence, you'd like to understand how those organisms live in that environment. So programs like um, the uh, Genomes to Life program uh, that Physical Biosciences, Earth Sciences, and Life Sciences Division have together to try to understand how organisms live in the environment is giving us critical information about how these organisms uh, might sequester carbon even better with the idea that eventually we might be able to stimulate carbon sequestration in the soil. Now, um, another resource for us in uh, producing biofuels and in sequestering carbon from the atmosphere are algae and cyanobacteria. And uh, there are a huge number of different species in the world. We've sequenced very few of these, uh, and a lot of that sequencing now is going on at the Joint Genome Institute. But they are really responsible for a great deal of the carbon cycling in the environment. Once you have those sequences of those organisms, we might be able to use them to actually produce fuels. So a number of algae actually produce and sequester a, a large percentage of oils in their biomass, in some cases up to 30 to 50 percent of the biomass, and I've even heard upwards of 70 percent can be in the form of oils. And there are companies now uh, that are actually using algae to produce biofuels. You've probably heard about the press release um, from the Venter Institute um, and Synthetic Genomics where they got $500 million, uh, six, sorry, $600 million, 500 is what we got. Uh, <laughs> $600 million from Exxon to do research on algae, to try to engineer algae that will eventually produce biofuels. Uh, 
Um, and there's a company called Solazyme, actually here in the Bay Area, that's feeding algae sugar, um, not using sunlight, but actually feeding them sugar because these algae actually produce a large percentage of oils. So I think uh, this research has enormous potential both for sequestering carbon dioxide and also for producing fuels. Um, but to do so, we're going to have to understand how to engineer these algae. Uh, they grow really slowly in most cases. Um, and once you have the algae, you've got to get all the water out so that you can get the fuels. Um, much of this is done in pure culture, but that really isn't um, going to be compatible with having an open environment. Um, and how are we going to deal with pathogens? And of course, then we're going to have a great deal of wastewater. So, um, and some of which we might be able to use. So we have a great deal of work to do to understand how algae function and to be able to engineer them. But we also have a great deal of work already going on here. So we've uh, had a long program in understanding photosynthesis in algae. Um, and this has been going on since the days of Melvin Calvin. Um, but we need to understand better how they fix carbon dioxide. Joint Genome Institute is annotating and validating a number of the genomes of algae, and uh, we're now developing predictive models of algae metabolism and trying to understand algae host pathogen interactions. Now, I just want to mention some work uh, that's been funded through an LDRD on trying to understand carboxysomes as catalysts. These are uh, actually uh, protein structures, and they actually have this structure. So, here are some of these organisms that contain these carboxysomes. And these have incredibly um, uh, well-defined structures. The outside is totally protein um, as a structure. And inside, it encapsulates rubisco. Well, rubisco is used to fix carbon dioxide. And uh, it's very sensitive, uh, in some cases, to oxygen. So uh, how actually uh, these carboxysomes are made how the rubisco gets to the inside of the carboxysome, how it keeps oxygen out and lets CO2 in. All these are really important problems for understanding and improving carbon uh, fixation. Uh, but uh, this team, led by Cheryl Kerfield, um, is actually working on uh, how to improve production of carboxysomes and just to understand how they're made. And with that, information, then, of course, we could use these as catalysts for a number of other biological processes. So just closing a little bit on some of the technical challenges I've already alluded to, uh, plants have been, uh, have evolved to be very resistant to uh, degradation and, and deconstruction. Actually developing processes that will get around this are really important, but yet keeping those plants viable in the environment. Uh, biomass contains a number of groups that end up uh, inhibiting downstream processes. We have to understand how we can either eliminate those or alleviate their effects. Uh, we'd like to engineer better biofuels. There's a lot of biology that still needs to be done there. Um, much of the sugar that's contained in biomass can't be used by organisms like yeast, so we have to engineer yeast to make that better and more efficient. Um, and we need more efficient and more robust uh, algal communities and algal or organisms uh, to produce biofuels. Um, some other challenges. What happens if a lot of the food crops are replaced with biofuel crops? What's going to happen to the price of food? Um, and, and what's the world going to say about that? I, I think this is an enormous problem, and a lot of people have been working on this problem. But we have to think it through carefully, um, because in no case do we want to replace food with fuel. However, as we develop and engineer better fuel crops, crops that are much more efficient, it'll take much less land area, and therefore we'll have better land area uh, or more land area for producing foods. What's more, many of the crops we're looking at, like switchgrass, will grow on marginal lands. And clearly, they won't produce as much as if they're on uh, well-irrigated uh, good land. But we can util utilize some of these marginal lands uh, to produce biofuels and sequester carbon. Um, other challenges, the amount of water it's going to take to produce biofuels. It's, it's going to be incredible, which means that we're going to have to recycle water and, and use water very carefully. 
Of course, I've already talked about fertilizer use. If we could actually engineer corn to fix nitrogen so we don't have to add fertilizer, that would be a huge savings in terms of energy and cost. And of course, collection and distribution of biomass. How do you get it from all the farms into a central processing facility? So models are being developed and many more are needed in order to understand this process. And of course, then the economics and societal challenges around adoption of biofuel crops. When I first started, just a, a, a personal note here, when, I, uh, when we first got the grants from EBI and, and JBay, um, my father, who's a corn farmer in Nebraska, um, and whose corn goes to producing ethanol, said to me, what are you trying to do, put me out of business? Um, and, and the answer's <laughs> no, I'm not trying to put him out of business. Um, uh, I actually think that we can make uh, the Midwest into the new Mideast. Um, and, and actually revitalize agriculture in the US. But uh, certainly, uh, public perception is going to be very important. And uh, getting society to accept that uh, is going to be very important. So uh, with that, uh, I think I'll close. And I'd be happy to take any questions or comments. Right. Oh, I, I agree completely, and then, and that's why we've taken the philosophy of uh, that we should be producing fuels that are, that are compatible with our infrastructure. Um, but you know, you don't have to make the carbon uh, uh, argument. You can make the economic argument, which is we're never going to be able to afford to replace all of that infrastructure. We can't replace all of the pipelines and. Uh, you know, refineries and all of that, we'd like to be able to utilize to the extent that we need to. So, um, yeah, I agree with you completely. Uh, you haven't mentioned uh, cane, sugar cane, which of course gets in the paper a lot now because going. we sold too many so successfully, I guess. Uh, but I, I, I suppose that's because the U.S. is not really a proficient place to do this as far as a lot of water. Oh, cane is a great source uh, of sugar. Um, because it's very e easy to release it from, obviously, from the biomass. Um, and Brazil has done wonders with sugarcane and turning it into, in this case, ethanol. Um, they're going to be producing some diesel down there shortly. But um, uh, cane, I think it'd be great. The problem with the U.S. and cane is that they're, you know, you can only grow it, say, in Alabama and Georgia and a few places, Louisiana and Hawaii. <laughs> yeah. The land there is a little is prohibitively expensive. Um, uh, but an alternative is sweet sorghum. And in fact, there are some varieties of sweet sorghum. This is a tall, grassy plant um, that produce more sucrose than some varieties of sugarcane. And uh, there's a company called Ceres here in California that's uh, spending a lot of time and energy on uh, sweet sorghum. I think it could be a great biofuel crop. And you know, the nice thing about the technologies that we're developing here is that um, they're really sugar neutral. We're, we're developing omnivores that uh, will be able to take in uh, you know, sugar from cellulose, sugar from starch, sugar from cane. And that's really where you want to be, too. <laughs> 
Right. So the question is, you know, what are the economics? Factoring yeah, factoring in the economics of, of fertilizer. And, you know, that's part of the issue around corn ethanol is the amount of fertilizer that's needed. And, you know, I, I mentioned this um, little factoid of a third of the energy in U.S. agriculture goes to producing nitrogen-based fertilizers and 1% of the world's energy. And you can just translate that into carbon, um, into the atmosphere, right? So clearly by either um, using crops that don't require nitrogen-based fertilizers or by putting nitrogen fixation into something like corn, you could clearly reduce by a huge amount the amount of carbon dioxide released into the atmosphere. It's not everything, but it's an important aspect of it. 